well. And we'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Amanda Turner. I am the sports dietitian with Children's Hospital Sports Medicine Center. And today we're gonna to be talking about holiday performance plates. A uh, good timing with Thanksgiving being this week, even though I know it's looking uh, quite different than usual for most of us here. Um, I do wanna go ahead and draw your attention to the chat box. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, you're welcome to type them in the chat box. Um, either direct those to me, again, my name's Amanda, um, or you can direct them to everyone, that's fine. I will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. So if you're worried you're gonna forget the question, go ahead and type it in the, the chat box. However, um, before that even, you'll notice that my colleague posted a um, review for the talk. If you can go ahead and click on that link that's in the chat box there, uh, just have that popped up. And then as soon as the presentation is over, it'll all be ready for you. And it'll, you'll have the presentation fresh in your mind so that you can give us some feedback on what you liked, what you didn't like, and what we can change for the future. Um, so we would very much appreciate that because we're always looking to give you guys the information that you want and need um, and make it better for you so that you can continue learning. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I don't see the thing in the chat. So uh, you clicked on the little square in the chat? I clicked on the chat and it shows just blank. Okay, uh, we'll look into that and see if there's another way we can get, get that to you. Okay, thanks for letting me know. Okay, so we'll, we're gonna get started with um, talking about what nutrition factors improve, imp, impact performance to start with. Um, so that's gonna be the, the first thing that we need to know is, you know, when we're talking about performance plates for the holiday, what exactly helps with performance with nutrition? Uh, we're gonna talk about common holiday nutrition changes. Um, I'm gonna talk from my experience and my other athletes' experience. Maybe your experience is a little different, but we can always talk about that at the end as well. And then we're also gonna talk about sample holiday performance plates. So why during the holidays, it may look a little bit different, um, but we still wanna be focused on making sure that we're getting the right nutrition to help us continue uh, to perform our best when we're out on the field. So starting with that nutrition for performance piece, there's five different things that I like to focus on to make sure my athletes are performing their best. So this is everyday athletes, regardless of the time of year, we wanna look for these five things. Um, the type of macronutrients that we eat. So that's the, um, we'll talk about macronutrients in just a second, but we wanna make sure there's good variety. The amount of macronutrients that we eat. Our vitamin and mineral intake, these are also called micronutrients because we need them in small amounts throughout the day. Uh, our timing of nutrition, and then finally our hydration. So we're gonna talk through each of these in detail first. So when I use the term macronutrients, if you haven't heard that before, macronutrients are the necessary nutrients that provide energy for our normal metabolism. So these three nutrients that are listed here are the ones that help us grow, the ones that help recover our muscle mass, the ones that provide us with energy, and the ones that help regulate our hormones. So they're really important to make sure we're getting these in adequate amounts on a daily basis. So those three nutrients, we've got carb, we've got protein, and we have fat. Carbohydrate is our main energy source, especially during sport, especially during high intensity movement. Um, so think if uh, your teammate just stole the ball, kicks it down the field, and you're sprinting after the ball, uh, that is very high intensity. That's where we're using carbohydrate. So this is a really important performance nutrient. I would say this is the most important um, macronutrient when it comes to uh, the quality of your performance. We need about 55% of our total energy intake from this nutrient um, and potentially even more when we're in season and we're burning a lot of energy and we're in practice for longer periods of time. Protein is the nutrient that helps us to build tissue. It helps aid in growth. Um, and we need about 15% of our total energy from this nutrient. So in, in the scheme of things, the amount of protein we need is relatively small. But it's, I do see some athletes who aren't getting enough protein. So if they're not um, focused enough on getting these high protein foods, then sometimes we can fall short and that can start to impact muscle recovery, uh, bone tissue, as well as growth in the long term. 
And then fat is an, another really important nutrient, um, helps with nutrient absorption. Some nutrients can only be absorbed if we have fat in our stomachs. Um, those vitamins include vitamin A, D, E, and K. Vitamin K in particular is one that's found in green leafy vegetables, like your salad greens. Um, so, you know, putting dressing on a salad is not only really tasty and, and helps the salad taste better, but it's also really functional. The oil from the salad dressing helps us actually absorb the nutrients from the salad. Um, it helps with temperature regulation in the body. So it keeps us warm when we need to be warm and cool when we need to be cool. Uh, helps with cell growth, and it also helps with hormone regulation, which will help with muscle growth on down the road. We need about 30% of our total energy intake from fat. So again, a really important nutrient. It happens to be a really dense nutrient. So we don't talk a lot about adding fat into our meals um, because it kind of usually comes naturally. If we have a baked potato, adding uh, cheese or butter or sour cream to it is a pretty natural addition to that. Um, so we're going to talk about how that gets incorporated into meals as we go forward. So what foods are under each of these categories? Um, some of you may already be very familiar with what foods fall into each category, and this may be new for others of you. Um, when people tend to think of carbohydrate, I get a lot of responses that, oh, it's bread or pasta. Um, those are the two most popular answers I get, but people forget that fruit and oatmeal and beans, um, sweets, all of those would fall into the carbohydrate category as well. Um, proteins, I feel like this one's pretty self-explanatory. So meats are gonna fall into protein. Dairy products like cheese, yogurt, milk, uh, eggs will fall into the protein category. And then our vegetarian proteins like beans and lentils, and then our soy-based products like tofu, edamame, and tempeh are all really good protein choices. And then when it comes to fat, um, we've got several fat choices here, avocados, nuts, and also seeds fall into that category. Um, those foods do have some protein in them, but it's pretty small compared to uh, the other choices that I mentioned under protein, which is why I put them in the fat category. Uh, butter, salad dressing is based out of oil, so that's a good fat source. And then coconut is a good fat as well as fried foods are going to be a fat source as well. So it's important to be able to identify where we're getting each of these nutrients from. So keep this food list handy. And again, we'll send this out at the end of the presentation, um, but keeping this food list handy can help you kind of really visualize where you're getting each of these nutrients from. Um, so I think the best way to really make sure that we're balancing our plate and getting not only the right type, but the right amount of, of macronutrients on a regular basis is by using these plates as our guide. Um, so for athletes that are in off season or they're only doing light activity, this is the best plate for you. So about a third of your plate would be the grains, which you see over here on the left, a third would be your veggie, and then a quarter would be your protein. Um, so how I like to describe this as getting uh, protein, carb, and color with every single meal. So we should be able to identify a protein source a carbohydrate source from that list before, and then some type of color. Color is always fruit or vegetable. Um, so we're really looking to have that fruit or vegetable at every single meal, ideally. Now, when we're in season or we've got heavier activity, so maybe you might, you might not be in season, but let's say you're still training really hard um, for an hour plus every single day. I would say this is like an hour and a half to two hours every day. Um, half of your plate then increases to your grains a quarter of your plate is your protein and a quarter of your plate is your veggie or your color component. So we've still got carb, protein, and color, um, but our proportions change because we're now burning more energy. So we need to take in more energy as well. Um, a lot of people see this as the veggies shrinking, but we're still getting those good uh, nutrient content from our grains and our fruits out of that other category. Um, so we still wanna make sure that that color piece is present, but we just wanna get more of those energy dense foods in uh, throughout the day. Um, you'll also notice on the, the picture here, you'll see the drinks on the top right hand side. And then there's some flavor enhancers like salt, pepper, and other seasonings. All of those things you can add in as you need. I will say with the drinks, I prefer to keep sports drinks during sport only. There are very special circumstances where I, I will recommend sports drink outside of a game or of a practice. Um, so I don't recommend sports drinks at lunch or at dinner on a regular basis. Have those when you're actually playing. 
Uh, and then you'll notice too, fat did, does change from the lower activity to the higher activity. So we go from about one tablespoon of fat with lower activity up to two tablespoons of fat per meal. Um, it doesn't make sense to measure the amount of fat you're putting at meals. I think that can get, um, that can feel a little too structured for a lot of athletes. So what I like to do is again, put fat where it makes sense. Um, if you are having a rice pilaf, maybe you're going to put some cheese on that. Uh, if you are having uh, toast, you're going to put some type of spread on it, like butter or peanut butter or cream cheese or um, avocado, right? So that makes sense in meals and it helps to enhance the flavor of meals. So um, just use it where it does make the most sense. Um, I don't have a lot of athletes who aren't getting enough fat, um, but if they are, then we, we typically will address that and make sure that we're adding more of that in. So some non-optimal plates, I like to point this out because people see those plates and they go, okay, I can kind of see where I'm missing, but I wanna just make it a little bit more clear if you feel like your plate is off from what those are. Um, so first non-optimal plate is my protein and carb eater. And if you can think of what this might be, this is my meat and potato person. So they like a steak, they like mashed potatoes with it, and that's all they're having with a meal. So we're missing the, the color component here, right? So um, shrinking down that protein, you actually don't need half a plate of protein. That's a lot of protein. Um, the half a plate of carb is great if you're being very active, but we need to get that veggie or fruit in there as well to have that color piece um, for more nutrient density, which we're gonna talk about when we get into vitamins and minerals. My second non-optimal plate is a carb and color only plate. So a good example of this one is an athlete that eats buttered noodles with a side salad. So I commend you for getting the noodles in and the salad. That's phenomenal, but we really need some protein with that. Um, so if you're not really into putting a meat sauce on your pasta or you don't really want to put meat on your salad, maybe add some eggs to your salad. Uh, maybe have a glass of milk on the side or yogurt on the side, but we need to make sure we've got that protein piece to help your muscles recover. And then the last non-optimal plate that I see often um, is this color plus protein plate. So we're missing the carb here. And this is probably the worst one to eat because carbohydrate, again, is our best nutrient for performance. Um, so a lot of times what I see in the color protein area is a big, beautiful salad with chicken on it, with dressing on it, but it's got no fruit, no beans, no rice, nothing, no bread on the side, no carbs with it. Um, so I think a salad can be a nice side item, but for athletes, it's usually not the best main meal item because it's not very well balanced. Unless you're getting like a quinoa salad that's got quinoa and veggies um, and some type of protein mixed into it. So keep that in mind as you're making meal choices going forward. Can we identify all three pieces at the meal? So this is kind of moving us into um, our amounts of food. So we're, we're working on that plate to balance the amount of each nutrient. Um, and we're also going to talk about over and under consuming macronutrients. So I want you to think, how do you know when you overeat? Do you know what that feels like? And what about when you don't eat enough? Do you know what that feels like? Or do you, your parents maybe know when you haven't eaten enough because you get a little moody, right? Because I'm that person too. Um, or what's typical for you around the holidays? Do you tend to eat too much and not feel too great? Um, do you tend to under eat and feel more hungry and feel kind of low on energy? So um, under and over consuming on food can make us or can negatively impact our performance. And so what we want to do is get more in tune with our body to really recognize when we're feeling hungry and when we're feeling satisfied so that we're not experiencing these huge ups and downs with our performance. So this scale that you see in front of you is called the hunger and fullness scale. It's one of my favorite tools with my athletes. And if you've seen me talk before, you've probably seen it before. At the low end of this scale is when we feel too hungry. So we are uncomfortably hungry. A two is what I consider hangry. And so you get a little attitude or fooditude, we like to call it, uh, with people around you because you need something to eat and you can't concentrate very well. Um, or a number one is when you start to feel starving, you feel weak, lightheaded, uncomfortable, or dizzy. This is like you feel so hungry, you feel sick almost if you've experienced that. The problem with getting that low on the scale and getting that hungry is that your body sees this as an emergency. The red flags are going off 
and you need to eat as soon as possible and whatever is available. So if you were to sit down at Thanksgiving dinner and you feel at a one or a two, you're gonna eat fast, you're gonna eat whatever is in front of you and more than likely you'll eat to the point where you feel a little over full because you're just trying to fix the emergency of getting food into your body. Okay, so getting too hungry is not a good thing on a regular basis. Um, on the opposite end of the scale is getting too full. So when we get too full, uh, we can start to feel somewhat uncomfortable, stuffed, or physically like, like we're gonna be sick. Um, when I was younger, I remember getting to this 10 and actually getting sick at Thanksgiving dinner. Um, we had a culture in our family of eat as much food as possible, eat all of the food. Um, and I got sucked into that and was, you know, trying to, I'm competitive. So I was trying to compete with my dad and my grandpa for how much food we were eating. Uh, and it was a terrible, terrible thing. And they thought it was hilarious. So I didn't get very good feedback on how to manage that well. Um, but when you get to these upper ends, we're eating too much. Um, it's going to make you feel pretty terrible. It's not going to make you want to exercise or continue movement. Um, so it will negatively impact your performance over time. So ideally, we're going to start eating when we feel out that like three hunger. That means that we're going to have normal meals and snacks throughout the day so that when we go into a Thanksgiving uh, lunch, afternoon um, meal or dinner, we feel hungry and excited to eat, but we're not starving, right? We haven't like saved up for the day. That's a really big no-no for Thanksgiving and for athletes in general. It's just depleting all of your energy stores for the day and making you feel like crap. Um, and then we're going to eat until we feel satisfied. So it's good to just pause halfway through your meal, um, identify how full you're feeling in that moment uh, before you're finishing the rest of the meal with the goal of feeling full, warm, cozy, satisfied, but not uncomfortable. Um, I don't want you guys feeling that same feeling that I felt when I was younger. Um, and so this can be a really good learning tool. The power of this tool is that you guys are the only ones who know how hungry and how full you're feeling at any moment. Um, so if you get outside influence to eat this, don't eat that, that type of thing, um, they don't know how you're feeling hunger and fullness wise. So you really have to own how hungry you are and stand up for yourself as to if you're going to eat something or if you're not going to eat something. Okay. So again, this three to seven range is ideally where we would stay to make sure that we're getting the right amount of nutrients that we all need. I will say some athletes um, do not have this skill as fine-tuned as we would like. So some athletes feel full really fast at meals um, and that's, that's really not a normal cue. So if you're one of those athletes that tends to eat a few bites and then feel really full quickly, um, that's something that I would recommend talking to a sports dietitian or physician about just so that they can inv investigate further and see why you're feeling so full even though you haven't met your energy needs. Now moving into vitamin and mineral intake. So again, these are considered micronutrients. We need them for normal metabolism too, but we need them in a lot smaller amounts than carb, protein, and fat that we just talked about. So the list that I have here is a short list of some of the micronutrients we need on a daily basis. But these are the ones that I typically see my athletes uh, not getting enough of on a regular basis. So I wanna dive into these just so that you can see how different the food groups are and why it's so important to get a variety of food on a daily basis. So for vitamin C, um, citrus is a really great source of vitamin C, strawberries, tomatoes, but also potatoes are a really good source of vitamin C. Yes, that includes white potatoes as well. Um, so we wanna make sure we have vitamin C for uh, normal tissue repair. We wanna have it for immune health as I'm sure a lot of you are aware. Um, and we also want to have that um, it's a scavenger nutrient. So when we damage our bodies through exercise or inhaling pollutants, um, remember when the fires were really bad, we're inhaling that smoke, that's a pollutant that can cause damage to our bodies. Vitamin C helps to fight off that damage. So athletes actually need more vitamin C than the, the traditional, um, you know, everyday person. However, it's very easy to get this through food. And I like it as a food source better than a supplement. So um, it's really easy to get vitamin C through food. So try to focus on these foods. And there's others that also have vitamin C too. Uh, calcium and vitamin D, as you guys know, are our bone nutrients. During this kind of, I, I think I targeted this talk towards our teenage area, but even if you're younger, 
um, that's when you're really laying down the most bone that you will have for the rest of your life. So we put on 90% of our bone mineral mass as we go through adolescence. And then after that, we only gain an extra 10%. You guys are athletes, you should have higher bone mineral mass. We wanna make sure we've got enough calcium and, and D uh, in your bodies in order to make sure those bones are getting large and strong so that you don't get injured on down the road. Um, so for calcium, dairy or fortified non-dairy milks are great options. Tofu is another really great option for calcium. Uh, greens like spinach do have calcium in them but it's not very well absorbed, which is why I didn't put it on this list. And you have to eat a lot of it um, in order to get enough calcium. Um, so it's, it's a good bonus if you like those foods to get extra calcium in, but these are gonna be your main food sources of calcium. And then for vitamin D, salmon and cod are gonna be your two best sources of vitamin D. If you eat those on a regular basis, way to go, keep it up. Um, if you don't, then fortified dairy and egg yolks are your other two good sources. These are really the only food sources of vitamin D. And then the sunlight will also um, prompt your body to produce vitamin D if you're not wearing sunscreen. Now, I am not encouraging you to not wear sunscreen. Um, it only takes like 10 minutes out in the sun to produce vitamin D by the sun's rays, but that's only during the summer months really for us. Um, so it's good to get your vitamin D levels checked to just see where they're at, because again, you need that in order to absorb calcium in your bones. Uh, potassium found mostly in plant-based foods. So potatoes, beans, uh, bananas, and spinach are your top ones for potassium. Iron, uh, potassium helps with muscle contraction as well. So it's a really important one for athletes. Iron helps to carry oxygen to working muscles. So when your heart rate goes up and you start breathing heavy on the field, the whole purpose of that is to deliver oxygen to those working muscles. So having enough iron in your body is so important to actually deliver that iron to those, excuse me, to those working muscles. So beef, poultry are great sources of iron. And then our more vegetarian sources, beans and lentils are good, as well as fortified cereals that'll have some extra iron added into it. Magnesium, another really important one for metabolism. Athletes have higher metabolism than, than average humans. So we wanna get enough of that for that reason, as well as uh, bone health as well. So nuts, seeds, spinach, beans, most of my athletes get enough magnesium through things like peanut butter, um, but it is something to pay attention to and make sure you're getting some of these foods on a regular basis. Sodium is one that athletes lose more in their sweat it is not naturally high in what we would consider whole foods. So the foods that you're sitting on here, seeing on here are not um, traditionally high in salt for the most part. However, we do get a lot of sodium from canned foods, uh, prepackaged foods, frozen foods, and dining out. So if you incorporate those things into your diet, you're probably getting enough sodium on a daily basis. But if not, if you cook most meals from scratch, um, then adding a little bit of table salt to your meals is not a bad idea. But you definitely don't need to add salt if you're going out for pizza or if you're having Chipotle or something like that. They add extra salt into those foods to help with the flavor. Uh, zinc is a good one for healing, especially and for muscle health, found primarily in more of your meat-based foods. Uh, but then we've also got beans and fortified cereals there as well. And then fiber and phyto phytonutrients. Uh, fiber is going to help not only with the digestive tract and the heart health, um, it's also attached to these phytonutrients that help improve our performance. So things that are red in color or whole grains or black beans, those really vibrant colors that we see with foods, those all provide different phytonutrients to our body. And we found a good correlation between having higher levels of those in our body and lower levels of inflammation and sometimes even muscle pain. Um, so it's really important to make sure we're getting plenty of those plant foods like whole grains, fruits and veggies, legumes, and nuts and seeds should also be on this list as well. So the key takeaway here, I don't expect you to be frantically trying to figure out how to fit all of those foods in your day. Um, the key takeaway is make sure you're eating all food groups on a regular basis. So grains and starches, we want to have at least half of our grains from whole grains, like whole wheat pasta, um, maybe we're doing oatmeal or brown rice. Those are all whole grains and we can throw beans and potatoes in there as well. Um, we want to choose a protein source at every meal. 
have two to three pieces of fruit a day, ideally, and two to three servings of vegetables a day, ideally. Fats, again, we're going to work those in with our meal. If we're having a salad, we're going to put dressing on it. Uh, if we're having toast in the morning, maybe we put butter or avocado on it. And then dairy or a dairy substitute three to four times a day um, to get that calcium and vitamin D in on a daily basis. So balance is key. Um, I, I don't encourage my athletes to cut out whole food groups. Um, if you have an allergy, that is one thing, but we can usually find a substitution that has similar nutrition. So cutting out all grains does not make sense for athletes. Moving into nutrition timing for performance, um, we know that eating throughout the day is the best way to promote muscle recovery and improve performance. But it's also important to note that one meal a day does not make you a better athlete and one meal a day does not make you a worse athlete. So I think this is really important to remember as we go into the holiday season too. Um, our goal is really consistency and making sure we're eating consistently throughout the day. So this, uh, this chart is built based on a research study where we looked at three different types of eaters. We had a snacker, we had someone who ate every three hours, and we had a person who ate two big meals a day. So this is our snacker here in the green. Our snacker eats eight times a day, and our snacker has about 10 grams of protein every single time that they eat. Um, so this is the person that seems to always be eating, but they never eat a, a huge amount in one sitting. Um, but our snacker with their eight times a day and 10 grams of protein each time, they're getting 80 grams of protein over the course of the day. So we compared our snacker to our um, athlete who eats four times a day, every three hours. This athlete has breakfast, lunch, dinner, and an afternoon snack. Uh, they have bigger meals because they're eating less often and their bigger meals have a little bit more protein in them too. So they're getting about 20 grams of protein at each meal. Um, so this athlete still is getting 80 grams of protein, but they're eating four times a day instead of eight times a day. And then finally, the research looked at um, an athlete who eats twice a day. So this is the athlete that likes two big meals a day. Um, again, their meals are bigger, so they're getting more protein. They're getting about 40 grams of protein at each meal, but they're really only eating twice a day. So after they finish dinner, the next time they eat is not until lunch the next day. So looking at this, do you think you know which athlete recovers the best, has the best strength gains, and has the most power gains? I just want you to think in your head who that might be. And our winner is the athlete that eats every three hours. So eating decent sized meals, but regularly throughout the day um, promotes optimal recovery for your body. Um, eating twice a day doesn't give you enough opportunity to continue to replenish um, protein in your body so that you can recover. And eating too often, but not enough, doesn't give it enough of a protein threshold or enough of, of protein in, in one sitting in order to fully saturate um, these cells that help us grow muscle and get stronger. So for all of the athletes on this call, I don't ever recommend that you eat less than four times a day. So four times a day is a really normal amount to eat. Um, if you're a two times a day eater, we're just going to have to change up those meals. So those meals will shrink a little bit and we'll add a third and a fourth uh, or a third meal and a, a fourth snack in there as well. So it may take a little restructuring, uh, but this is a good time to focus on it, especially if you are off of school for a week or two, potentially. Also in nutrition timing, besides just eating regularly throughout the day, fueling both before and after exercise is really important too. So what you eat before exercise will fuel that day's exercise. So it's kind of like topping off the gas tank in your car if you're going to have a long trip. So we want to get carbohydrate in primarily before we exercise because that tops off our gas tank so that we can play hard and go for a long time and really like empty out the tank there. Fueling after exercise with both carbohydrate and protein is what helps you get better over time. And so if you're missing a recovery meal or a recovery snack, um, that could be hampering how much progress you're seeing over time with your performance. I put a few snacks here as some suggestions. These are just a couple suggestions. There are many different ways that you can take this, uh, but I wanted to give you a couple different options to get started here. Um, to continue to build on our post-practice fuel or our recovery fuel, um, I just wanted to reiterate why this is so important. So ideally, I like my athletes to be eating something within an hour after practice. 
So if you are going into holidays and you're still going to be training relatively um, consistently, you need to make sure we have either a snack or a meal timed after exercise. So if you get out of practice, if practice goes from 3.30 to 5.30, you get home at six, it makes perfect sense for you to just have dinner at that time. Uh, let's say you've got practice from uh, 8 a.m. until 10 a.m. on the weekend. Maybe you wanna put a snack there because you're not, gonna, you're not planning on having lunch until 11 or 12. So um, you get to decide what that looks like and it doesn't matter if it's a snack or a meal, but you need something that's got carbohydrate and protein after exercise. So this graph that you see in the background, that green line that kind of is a squiggle that goes up and down, that is what happens to our muscle absorption after we finish exercise. So after exercise, if that bottom line, the zero is normal, after exercise, we are super elevated and our muscles can absorb a lot all at one time. Um, so for about 30 minutes is where we get the biggest peak, but you can see it stays really elevated up through almost three hours. That's what that total timeline is. Um, so ideally we would have, again, a meal or a snack right after exercise, and then we're still going to have another meal or snack two hours later. Um, and if it's early in the day, we'll continue that same type of pattern. If it's in the afternoon, you'll probably have dinner, a nighttime snack, and then go to bed for recovery too. Um, but this regular eating will help you build muscle, get stronger, um, and build glycogen or carbohydrate stores in your muscles so that you'll have more power and more speed when you're on the field. Um, so this is a really important piece. But again, I want to emphasize that if you're really focused on your recovery and you're eating a really beautiful recovery meal, but you're eating pizza the rest of the day, that's not optimizing your performance. You're getting that one piece in, but it really takes all of these components to make you the best athlete possible. Okay, so here's a sample maximum performance plan. So if I were planning uh, someone's in food intake and they would eat anything they didn't care, uh, this would be basically what I would plan for them. So uh, this, let's say this is a school day because it's a pretty early breakfast. So 6.30 a.m. breakfast, egg sandwich with cheese and avocado on a whole grain English muffin with fruit and milk. At nine, they're gonna have a snack. It's a trail mix that's got granola, dried fruit and nuts. At 11 is lunchtime. It's a PB and J on whole grain bread with a banana and Greek yogurt with some raspberries. Before practice, this particular athlete likes crackers and hummus, which is a great pre-practice snack unless hummus bothers your stomach, which it does for some people. So if hummus does bother your stomach, you can switch that out for like peanut butter or something else as a dip. After, snack after practice snack, uh, this athlete is having some cherry juice for their carb and some cheese as their protein. And then for dinner, my favorite dinner, salmon, rice, broccoli, and a glass of milk. So again, I realize this is not an ideal holiday plan. We're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, but if I were planning for maximum performance, this would be the type of plan we're looking at. Now, let's say we don't have school uh, and maybe you like to sleep in. So we're gonna change these times a little bit. So now breakfast is at 10 a.m. because we get up at like 9.30. Our morning snack, we're gonna move to an evening snack and after dinner snack because maybe you're staying up a little bit later but you've still promised me that you're gonna get eight to 10 hours of sleep, please, because you still need it. And then lunch, we're moving to 12. So our total day plan would look like breakfast at 10, lunch at 12, still a two and 5.30 snack, still dinner between 6.30 and eight, and then we're moving that morning snack to 9 p.m. So just moving times around if you like to sleep in a little bit later, but again, you're seeing this is three meals and two snacks a day. If you're not practicing, I think three meals and one snack or two snacks can work just fine really listen to your body. And when you're getting hungry, that's your body's way of telling you, hey, I need something here, okay? Okay, our final point on performance is hydration. Hydration is so important for performance. I put that up there with carbohydrate because those two things have been shown to have the biggest impact on how well you perform in a game. Um, you should be drinking water throughout the day. I don't care how you have to get it in, but you should be drinking regularly throughout the day. How much water varies um, from person to person. 64 ounces or eight, eight ounce glasses may not be enough, especially for a pretty high level high school athlete. 
one gallon is too much. That is not a goal for water. That's not an appropriate goal for anyone. The only people that I have that are drinking a gallon of water are guys that are training two a days for combine football. So if you can imagine what combine football players look like, um, they're usually a little bit bigger than my soccer players. So a gallon is, is generally too much fluid. Um, but all fluids count. Water counts, milk, tea, juice, shakes, anything that's in liquid form can count towards your fluid. I do encourage you to be very cautious with caffeinated beverages. I have some other talks on caffeine, but um, I like to use caffeine only as a performance tool, only on very special occasions. So I recommend not having caffeinated things on a regular basis. So your body's not getting used to that stimulant. Uh, but if you do have a cup of coffee here and there, or you do have a cup of tea here and there, you can count that as part of your hydration for the day. Um, half of your body weight in ounces, if you've heard this recommendation before, this is a non-active person's recommended hydration. So if you are totally off for a couple weeks, then yeah, that amount of fluid will be fine for you. So if you weigh 120 pounds, drinking 60 ounces then would be perfectly fine. Um, however, as soon as you start practicing, you're sweating more, you're losing more fluids through the air that you're breathing, um, your fluid needs go up pretty significantly. So how do we know exactly how much we need? Um, looking at your urine is the best way to really tell if you're hydrated. So ideally, you would need to go to the bathroom about every two hours, two to three hours is a really normal amount. Every 30 minutes is way too much. And every four to six hours is way too little. You're dehydrated then. So about every two hours is what we're looking for. When you pee, your urine should be colors one, two, or three. Uh, it should be the color of like a pale yellow post-it note. Although I don't even know if those are still in use nowadays. Um, or lighter. Totally clear is not the goal either, right? So if it's totally clear, you may be on more of that like every 30 minute going to the bathroom. And you may be actually a little... Uh, not too hydrated, but um, kind of flushing your body instead of actually hydrating your body. If your urine is colors number four through colors number eight, that is progressive dehydration. So four is usually where people will be the, when they wake up in the morning, when you haven't drank anything all night, but it should get lighter from there, right? A four or five may also be what your urine looks like after you take a multivitamin, and that's also normal. You're just peeing out extra vitamins that your body didn't need. Um, so if you've just taken a multivitamin, that's not a reliable uh, urine sample for you to judge on your hydration. But if you're getting down to like an eight where you're looking like apple juice color, um, you're significantly dehydrated and we need to talk at some point. So um, again, shoot for that one, two or three or peeing every couple hours. So really paying attention, especially during school to make sure you're sipping on something. If you have online school, I know if you're in person school, it's a lot harder because of the masks nowadays. So we have to be really diligent about taking breaks, going outside, drinking some water and coming back in. Okay, so now that we know what nutrition factors impact performance, let's talk about the holidays. So some common holiday changes in nutrition that I tend to see more snacks are available. So there's just more food around the house, at least in years past. Again, I know this year is going to be a little bit different. Lack of meal structure. I actually saw this a lot with my athletes going, um, just going into quarantine initially. They just were kind of snacking all day and not really having meals because there wasn't any meal structure or, or day structure. So when you're out of school and you lose that structure um, that's naturally given to you, finding your own structure to eat meals and snacks can be really, really helpful. Favorite foods will be more available, which is exciting, but we also want to make sure we're still getting the nutritious foods in as well. Um, food persuasion. So if you have a, a pushy grandma like I do who likes you to eat a certain amount at um, at meals, that can be hard to deal with, especially around the holiday season. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, lower fruit and veggie intake. So again, when we've got all of these other things around the house, it's really easy and yummy to grab a cookie as you're walking through. So you may not be grabbing an orange quite as often. And then poor hydration. So again, uh, not having that water bottle next to you, not having structure and drinking regularly throughout the day. All of these things usually will change with the holidays. So when we're talking about performance nutrition over the holidays, we're, we're really trying to fo follow that same structure that we just talked about for performance, um, but we're being a little bit more flexible with some of our favorite holiday foods, basically. 
So the things I like to focus on are the positives. Number one, making sure we're getting in our fruits and vegetables. So eating the fruits and vegetables on a daily basis, trying to get three servings every day. So how you get three servings a day is focusing on your one snack, lunch, and dinner all have that color piece to them. If you get color with every meal, you're going to hit your three servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Um, so that's a really easy way to think of, okay, I know that I got all my fruits and veggies in because I had color with every single meal. To stay hydrated, um, keep a cup or a water bottle with you and make sure you're drinking it throughout the day. Some athletes will set reminders on their phone to make sure they're drinking regularly throughout the day as well. Uh, don't skip meals, keep three meals and somewhere between one to two snacks a day. So we want to keep that structured fueling habits. It, again, if you're sleeping in later and that doesn't impact anything else in your life, fine, but you still need three meals and at least one snack every day. Um, so making sure that you're still getting that in is important. And then finally, enjoy your favorite foods. Um, don't be shy to add in a cookie pie or another favorite as part of the carb portion of your meal. Um, so we're going to actually visualize what that looks like next. So when we're building a holiday performance plate, um, again, we've got more favorite foods. We've got more um, just kind of high palatability, things that taste really good that are around us. Um, so we want to make sure we're working those in so we're not feeling deprived and so that we can enjoy them because it's a, it's a fun time of year to do that. Um, so I've got a few different sample meals here that we're going to use on our performance plate. So the first one's very straightforward. This is not a traditional um, Thanksgiving plate, I would say, because it's low on food, but uh, maybe you're going to have turkey, mashed potatoes, and salad. So you are fine with only having three foods for Thanksgiving. Uh, you're going to have your little portion of tur turkey that's going to be about palm-sized. You're going to have mashed potatoes, which is like a fist and a half in your third of the plate. And then you're going to have like a fist and a half of salad with your salad dressing or avocado or nuts or cheese on it too. Okay. That's a very straightforward plate. And that's how you would balance it to make it a performance plate. But let's say you're more of the, I'm going to try a little bit of everything that's out here on the buffet, which is what I like to do as well. Um, so this is what your plate looks like if you've got more foods, right? So we've got deviled eggs as our protein. Maybe you're not liking meat so much, but you like deviled eggs. Um, you want to have both sweet potato casserole and pumpkin pie. Both of those taste sweet, which is an indicator that they fall under carbohydrate. So that's going to fall into your carbohydrate portion. So what we're going to do is just split that portion of the plate, put our pie on one piece and put our sweet potato casserole on the other side. Uh, and then um, one of my favorites, green bean casserole and then Brussels sprouts as well. You're going to have those as your veggies. So you're going to, again, split that piece of the plate you have that third of the plate, part of it's going to go to your green beans, part of it's going to go to your Brussels sprouts. So that's how you divide it and still get it all on one plate. Now I will say, if you finish this plate, you're being mindful. You don't want to feel stuffed because you, you know, Amanda has felt that way and it's not a fun feeling. Um, so you finish this plate and you, you wait a few minutes, you take a couple drinks of water and you're like, man, I'm still hungry. What do you do then? You go back and you get a little bit more food if you're still actually feeling hungry. Um, but if you're starting to fill up before you finish the plate, then being mindful there as well and stopping before you get over full is important too. So remember, usually in the holidays, and again, I know this year looks different, but usually we have leftovers and we have these foods that are available for several days. Um, I would say most people from, from now until the new year, we've got fun foods available. Um, so you're going to get plenty of opportunity to eat these foods over time. Okay, so let's move um, into more of a non-traditional holiday. So I'm actually thinking about having tacos this year for my Thanksgiving feast with my family. Um, and so, and, but this might also be a normal meal for you as well. So this is how we break down something with lots of different meal components. Um, so for tacos, your ground beef and your cheese would be your protein. Your beans would also fall into that protein a little bit there too. But then we're gonna count the, the rest of the beans and the tortillas as your carbohydrate, and then your sauteed veggies and your lettuce is going to count as your color component for that plate. Now, I will say, if you're making regular tacos and you put your veggies on your tacos, are you getting a full third of a plate of vegetables? Maybe not. So you may have to add a little uh, extra veggies on the side or really pack the veggies into your tacos to make sure you're getting about a third of your food from those veggies. 
Um, but this is how we would kind of break down these plates. Now, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to mention about the plates. Oh, I did pick the lower activity plate because I assume around the holidays, most of us have uh, slightly lowered activity at least. But if you're still training hard, again, if you're training for an hour and a half a day, most days, it's appropriate for you to have half of a plate um, of your grain or your carbohydrate. So you would just adjust that line and then fill in that half of a plate. So maybe you're thinking, okay, Amanda, that's really nice and all, but I just want to eat, eat pie for a meal, or maybe I want to eat two slices of pie for a meal. So what do you do then? So my recommendation is I want you to enjoy your pie. I also want you to feel good after having that. And so thinking about when you're going to have your next meal and planning your pie as your carbohydrate with that meal with a veggie or a color and a protein um, would be the best way to feel your best when you're enjoying these foods. Having a slice of pie as a snack is delicious, um, but we tend to crash from that pretty quickly. So it doesn't sustain your energy for very long. Um, so I would try to focus more on having that as part of a meal as opposed to as just a one-off item. Um, or what about items like mac and cheese? You wanna have mac and cheese only for a meal? Well, we can make mac and cheese be a little bit more balanced too. Using those same items, we could chop up a little bit of our leftover ham, chop up some of our leftover asparagus and either mix that in or have it on the side would be just fine. So we're getting again, carb, protein um, and color with that meal still, okay? So I'm hoping I'm giving you guys some ideas on how this stuff can be incorporated and still fit a very balanced plate where we're still getting lots of nutritious foods. So um, for a summary with our holiday performance plates, you get an opportunity to eat delicious foods at each meal time. So that's three times every single day. So thinking about that and working in those favorite foods is the best way to not feel deprived from those foods. So you don't feel like you have to overeat on those things. We still need nutritious foods to fuel our body and to feel our best. And so especially if you're training or even if you're not training, you don't want to continue to eat um, only pie or only pizza throughout this time and then go back and try to exercise hard because you just don't feel good when you come back from that. And I know that from experience as well. So we're just trying to balance the two so we can still enjoy and feel our best at the same time. All foods can fit over the holidays. There's no foods that you should feel like you have to place completely off limits. Um, that's not appropriate. I want you to listen to your own body's hunger and fullness cues. You can politely decline invitations to eat more if you're feeling full, or you can go back and get seconds if you're still feeling hungry. It's normal for athletes to have higher hunger and need more food than non-athletes. Um, so if anybody is commenting on your food intake, if you have a pushy grandma that thinks she didn't eat enough of her um, apple salad or whatever it is that she has, um, let them know like, oh, it looks delicious. I feel full right now. Can I take some home with me? Um, that's always a really nice way to say, no, I'm not going to eat any right now. But yeah, I'd still like to show you that I love you by taking some of that food home with me. And again, maybe that will be less of an issue this year, but um, just some strategies on, on how to manage that. Um, and again, I just want to re re-emphasize that you are the only one that knows how you are feeling. So if you're feeling more hungry, honor that hunger. If you're feeling full, it's important to honor that fullness as well, knowing that you're still going to get more of that food later on too. Okay. So I'm going to open up for questions. I saw that some comments have been coming in. Um, this is my contact info. So you can email me at sportsnutrition at childrenscolorado.org. Um, if you are interested in scheduling a nutrition appointment to meet one-on-one -on -one with me to kind of dig into your nutrition more, that is the phone number for scheduling as well. Um, so let me just pull up our chat here. And if anybody has questions that they'd like to unmute themselves and ask, you're welcome to do that at this point too. <laughs> 